Hey coaches, welcome to today's first presentation for the Football Scoop Online Clinic where we have Beaumont High School head coach Jeff Steinberg joining us to talk about keys to getting your program in alignment and moving in the right direction, being all in. So coach, it's all yours. Great. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to talk and you know, I know we're, uh, we're going through some real challenging times and I think that um, the one thing that I guess if there's any saving grace, we're all going through this together. So there's never been a better time for coaches to, uh, to share and help each other out. And um, whether you like this guy or not, a uh, famous politician, he was chief of staff at the White House, um, also mayor, uh, Rahm Emanuel uh, was quoted at one time as saying, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that is it's an opportunity to do things that you couldn't do before. And I think that you know, as much as we're out of our comfort zone, this gives us an opportunity to, I guess, reach out and connect to our, to our own kids in, uh, in some unique and, and different ways. Um, so I would, just, I would just challenge all coaches to make the most of that opportunity and don't let it, don't let it pass you by. Um, when, uh, when you're hired as a head coach and, or you, you have a program, uh, on the left is, is what they perceive. They, they think you're a magician, you're just gonna snap your fingers, pull a rabbit out of, out of the hat but in reality it's more like you are a you know a, a laborer you're there's a lot of work that goes in um, um, at the ground level and below to, to build a strong foundation and uh, and I think that it's important for for coaches to uh, to realize that it's not it's not about that you have to let people know exactly what you're doing but you have to understand you're never going to just be able to get into a situation whether it's a great program or whether it's been underperforming, you're never going to be in a situation where you just go in and snap your fingers and make things happen. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. And it really starts with the guy at the top and that's, and that's the head coach. Um, I, I think that this is, this is a, a, a big one for us is never mistake activity for work. Um, a lot of people think that they're just doing some great things because they're keeping busy and, and doing a lot of different things in their program. But really what it amounts to is just a bunch of activity. And I think that you have to look at what's, what's the important stuff to make your program great and identifying those things and being able to, uh, to hit the ground running and, and get, get your, your sleeves rolled up and get to work because all the other stuff is really at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just fluff. You know, the social media and all of that stuff, I think it adds to the program, but ultimately that's not gonna be what makes, makes your program uh, great. When, uh, when I first started out as a head football coach, my first, uh, my first experience was at Burroughs High School, uh, Desert School, um, High Desert in California. And uh, I was really fortunate in that I, I had a book uh, that I read that made a big impact on me. And that was by uh, Frosty Westring, who was the head coach at Pacific Lutheran at the time. And uh, the title of the book was Make the Big Time Where You Are. And, and our first few years as a staff, we would, we would hum and haw about what we didn't have and what, had, what this other program had and, and that program had. And uh, once I read the book and we stopped worrying about what we didn't have, and let's just make this the best place that we can make it and not, not think so much about what other programs have, but let's make the best for our kids and let's make the most out of the talent we have. Well, once we started thinking that way, we started winning a heck of a lot more games and ultimately playing in a CIF championship twice, uh, winning once, going deep in the, in the playoffs every year and, and turning players out and just making our guys great, great young men in the community. So I think if, if, uh, if you haven't read that book, it's an easy read and it really makes a lot of sense. When you take over a program, there's always going to be uh, challenges. And I think that whether you're taking over a program um, and just coming in, or even with your own program, I think in January, December, January, every year, you need to identify, okay, what are the challenges that we have going into this next season? When you take over a program, what are the challenges that this program has? And what do I need to do to address those challenges and make this program great? One of one of the, uh, the biggest challenges for me was when I took over at Rancho Verde High School, Pete Duffy had been the coach and he's back there again now, but he had been the coach and they had done very well. And uh, early on, uh, just before I took the job, I thought, this is a great job, man. The culture's awesome here. Um, there's really no challenges. And a, a good friend of mine, very smart, he's, a, he's actually a mentor of mine, um, um, Rick Jones, who's uh, now at, at Missouri, 
said, Jeff, if you can't find any challenges in the, in a program, don't, don't take it. Cause you're going to run into a lot of pro uh, problems down the road. So it was just that time I started to kind of dig deep and, and look at, okay, what, what are some things that people may not see that aren't so apparent? And I started to find some challenges and I don't mean that in a negative way, but the challenges were what, what can I do to improve on what's already been done? Because Pete Duffy had done so many great things there. Um, I didn't think that it was like very apparent of all the things that needed to be done. So I found all the, all the things that I would consider challenges where we could grow and uh, turned out to be just a great stop for me. I really thought I'd be there for a very long time, probably the rest of my career, but um, this, uh, this opportunity opened up in, in my backyard. So, uh, so I wound up taking, uh, taking this job at, at Beaumont high school, which had its own challenges as well that, that we've been working on. And I think that it makes, it makes the ride so enjoyable when you can find challenges and be able to conquer those challenges and take your program to new heights. But again, there's a lot of work that's involved from the head coach, but also from the assistants and the administration, the parents and the community, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so really it's all about getting, getting everybody moving in, in the right direction, sharing the vision, um, understanding what the vision of the head coach is, uh, uh, are, and, uh, and from the head coach, it's all about having clear communication with everybody. So if you kind of look at the top, that's really where a lot of, I guess, companies, programs, businesses are, and, and it results from, you know, people having their own agendas, not being able to communicate uh, properly, not building up that, that culture uh, of excellence and having inconsistent standards. And then at the bottom is where we want everybody to be. So ultimately, you don't want people to be robots but you want everybody to understand, okay, this is the vision of the program. I want you to tie into this vision and help us go towards that vision in your own unique way with your own personality. And that's both coaches and kids. Um, and so that results from having just great communication, um, connecting with your kids, setting the expectations, and then just being on guard of, of the culture every day. Just because you throw up a sign and says this, and, and it says, this is what we're going to be. Well, it doesn't happen. You actually have to have to live that out on a daily basis and guard that culture. So the key ingredients really, um, firstly, you need a committed staff um, and I'm gonna get into that. The second one is you, you need support from your athletic department and the administration, both at the school and in the district. You need talented players, which you can develop. Doesn't mean that they just show up. Um, and then lastly, uh, support uh, from the parents in the community. And the way that you get all of those is, again, as the head coach, being able to sell your vision to everybody. Okay, so Steve Kerr from the Golden State Warriors, uh, he said it best when he said it, it starts with having the right people in place. And I think that it's important as a head coach that when you're bringing people on board, you make sure that the, they're number one, the right people. And then I think secondly, is you can find the best place for them in the program. So, um, uh, in, uh, I believe it was John Gordon's book, The Energy Bus, he said, uh, get the right people on the bus first and then worry about their seats second. So just understanding that it takes a lot of energy to, to get your program going. The, the head coach needs to have that vision. I think that it's important for guys to sit down and think about what's your vision of your, your program. Um, being able to sell that that vision to everybody, having the energy to be able to do that on a daily basis, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a raw raw guy, but you have to have that. You have to show that enthusiasm and that energy by how you go about your your business uh, every day. Um, and then you have to understand, um, and you have to get administration to, to understand that you can't do it alone. You need great people and great men in the program to help you um, get that vision uh, in place. Um, and so again, it's about getting the right people on first and then worrying about um, where they're sitting uh, second. Okay, so when we're hiring um, assistant coaches to come on staff, I look for three things. So the very first thing is pa passion, enthusiasm, and industriousness. So they have to have that passion um, and love for working with young kids these days. Um, they are uh, going through some very challenging times, just the way society is. I think kids generally want the same things that they've wanted for the past 20, 50, 70 years, but society's changed and our societal expectations on them have really changed as well. So they have to understand that these kids are really growing up in a tough world 
and they have to be totally hooked into them and enthusiastic about coming to work and developing these kids on a daily basis. And they need to be workers. Like coaches have to come in and understand that there's going to be delegated, uh, delegated opportunities for them to do some great things in the program. Um, and they have to be up for that task. The second one is they have to be so loyal to, uh, to my vision or the head coach's vision and help them sell that on, on a daily basis. And I tell, I tell our assistants that you're not only selling that when you're with the kids, but you're selling that when you're, you're out in public or you're at a restaurant, but even when you're at home with your own family. If your family sees that you love doing what you do and working with kids on a daily basis, it's easy for them to support you. If you go home and you're whining about um, all the things that you would perceive negative about the job, your family's going to a think you're nuts for continuing to coach or B they're going to, they're going to leave you at some point and they may not physically leave you, but they're going to check out when you, when you talk about um, football in school. And then the third one is, is they need to be competent. Um, so they have to have a strong knowledge base of, of the position that they're coaching. And there's been, there's been times in our program where, um, we've moved guys around. Like, um, I think that you need strength at every level. You don't just load the varsity up, but, but you need certain types of coaches, uh, especially at the freshman level who are great at connecting with kids and parents. And then also great at keeping those kids hooked in and loving football, because those are going to be kids that in some cases, it's their first time they've played football, but it's going to be their first athletic experience when they get to high school. So we, and we can make or break them. So we want to make sure that you know, those guys that are down at the freshman level are guys that are just great at loving kids up. Obviously, have to have a knowledge base of, of what they're coaching, but they're just great at connecting kids as well. Um, so just a, a few more things with assistant coaches. Uh, our guys need to be problem solvers. I don't want them bringing problems to me. Um, I've always, uh, it's always been a, a pet peeve of mine when coaches come with, hey, we need to do this. Uh, uh, I, I love the coaches. Uh, in our program that, that come to us with, hey, coach, um, we have this challenge and hey, this is something that I see as a way to be able to, to fix it or, 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 uh, or build on, on some of the stuff that we're doing. And it may not always get the, uh, I guess, the uh, proverbial uh, rubber stamp, but it usually winds up leading to us thinking about some other things and, and coming up with some solutions as well. And those are great coaches that come in and bring ideas to the table. Um, so really, they're in a lot of ways, coaches that have the ability to do things without me having to ask them to do it. They just kind of, again, they're, they're industrious. They, they see that work that needs to be done and, and they fix things. One of the, one of the, I think the greatest things that we did one year was uh, when I was at AB Miller high school, we designated somebody to be a counselor or an NCAA counselor um, slash ac academic coach. And he would check their transcripts he would check their grades every week and he stayed on top of it. And we used a coaching stipend for that. Um, and he did some really great things for us. And, and we didn't have any kids um, by my second year that were ineligible. And that was a tough school where we going in, going in when I took the job uh, and I got hired in the April, I found out that if we were to play football that, that week, uh, pretty much most of our team would not be eligible. So I think that was one of, of the, uh, I think the, the best moves for us was just to be able to identify somebody who wanted to work with the kids and we made him our academic coach uh, that year. And that was actually based off at the time, Long Beach Poly uh, was funded. They had a grant from the NFL for an academic coach and we went down there and met with them to see the stuff that they were doing. And we kind of built it off, off a lot of the stuff that they were doing back then. So really, it's, it's about, you know, creating an edge. And, and I think right now, like, with everybody going through um, this quarantine and the stay at home, um, how do you create an edge with your guys? And, and there's a good chance, like, okay, everybody's Zooming. Everybody's finding a way to get their kids to do home workouts. And, and I don't think that that's going to be the edge in this case. I think the edge really is about whatever you're doing, doing it on a level that is better than you've ever done before. So uh, we're doing some, some, some unique things with our guys right now in terms of workouts and, uh, and meeting time. Uh, and we're about to take it to another level uh, as we hit, um, I guess, spring football, we're going to call it. Um, and that's kind of what we're focusing on. It's not going to be that we're doing this meeting. Uh, so it's going to help us win games. It's going to be some of the creative things that I think that we're doing that, 
that we feel may be, may be cutting edge. Um, and I, again, I think that what you do is you go out to the best programs and you kind of steal or borrow uh, or tweak things that they're doing that could fit into your program. Um, and then just focusing on doing it at a, at a, at a level that would help you um, be successful. A lot of guys, they go in and, and, and I think early on in my career, it was, it was all about winning games and, and it just never seemed like we were winning enough games. Like we, we won, you know, four games our first year, obviously we wanted to, we wanted to build on that. And then the next year was six and then it was seven and then it was 10 and then it was, and then it was 12 and then it was 13. And, and, and none of those really ever satisfied the soul. Like, like it's, it's in, it's insatiable. The, the feeling of winning it's, it's short lived. And, and the, the feeling of losing is just, you know, you go through a million deaths and, and I thought there must be something better than this to, to get, to give me my fixes as, as a coach and, and uh, I guess a, a mentor or somebody who develops kids. And, and I found that once I started focusing on, on making an impact in their lives and helping develop young men for, to be great kids in, in society, once our staff focused on that, every year was enjoyable. Now, some years you're going to win a few more games because you have more talent or you've developed, you've developed a little more talent. But I think that when you focus on develop, developing them as a whole, it's such, it's such a satisfying feeling every year, especially when they come back or when their parents send you an email and you feel like, okay, you know what, we're doing some great things here with, uh, with kids. I would, I would also invite coaches to, uh, to come up with some, some core values for their program. So ours is like, we want to develop great relationships with our kids. And that's all about connecting. Um, I tell our coaches that at the end of the day, if all these kids see you as, as, as their football coach, we fail. They've got to see you as, as a big brother at times, a dad at times, a counselor, uh, a friend at times. Sometimes it's important to be that, that, that friend where where they can feel like you're listening to them and, and, and hearing what they say. Um, the second one is developing a, um, an atmosphere where we're competitive. And, and that's just about our kids competing every day. And then the third one is kids just being accountable for what they're doing and what our program is doing. And that's just owning it and ownership. So our, our three core values would be connect, compete, and ownership. And now our character qualities, um, focus on and include desire, courage, faith, discipline, cooperation, respect, perseverance. We feel that if you have those qualities and those core values, you're going to be able to go on and do some great things. It's hard to, it's hard to, uh, to play at the top and, and reach competitive excellence if you don't have that desire, if, you're not, if you don't have the courage to fight through and work through things, if you're not disciplined on a daily basis. So we feel like those are going to be the, the qualities that help us get to, um, to be elite. And so this is, this is going to help us move on to uh, today's athletes. And this is something that I think I saw from, from uh, a coach post on, uh, on, uh, on Twitter a while back. And it's a great, great poster that really says it all. Um, and if we look at today's athletes, um, this is kind of where they're at. Again, it's not them. It's the way society is. So they have very short attention spans. And again, that's just from, you know, from, from being able to, to move on to different things. And if you look at how, how shows are now, they're, 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 they're very short. If you don't like something, you can just X out of it, start something else. If you're playing a video game. If it's not working, you can start again. Um, there's a lot of things that they do that, that really give them their fix immediately. So social media is all about instant gratification um, with the likes and, 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 um, and uh, people uh, following you and all that stuff. And, and, you know, the whole thing with following you is like, I always ask our kids, do you really know any of those people? So out of, out of the 200 people that are following you, how many people have you actually met and talked to that you know? Um, as a, adults, we want to organize everything for them. Um, you know, we organize their day. I, I even catch myself doing it with my own kids at home. Helicopter parents um, or bulldozer parents, they want to just come in and, and they, they want to... Uh, they want to be able to control things or when things aren't going well, they're going to drop in and they're going to now, uh, 
you know, now tell you how it is. Um, the athletes generally, as a result of the way society is, we don't force them out of their comfort zone. So they want to stay in their comfort zone. Um, as a result, safety winds up trumping growth because we're keeping them in those cocoons. Uh, they're generally very immature in their relationships. And again, that, not their fault. When you give a kid a phone, um, and these kids are very uh, tech savvy, they're going to have all these relationships without having the face-to-face -face interactions and working through the daily problems that kids have to work through. Um, so again, so I always tell the coaches, and you can see it in yellow, is don't blame them. It's the world that we put them on in. And, and I, I really think that if anything, we have very tough kids being able to work through, uh, through society these days. So these are some things that, that hinder uh, motivation in our kids is there's just number one, way too many choices. So it's hard for them to stay committed to things. Um, our lifestyle is so fast paced right now. So it's hard to be motivated when we're just moving on to all these different things. Uh, the credit bubble. So kids can see that, you know, their parents have basically got all these things on credit and they haven't had to work towards those, those things. So it's very hard for our kids to understand that um, gratification is, is generally delayed. The real world, well, it's hard to say the real world, but things don't generally work, toward, uh, work, uh, work that way. You have to work towards things and it takes a lot of time to be great at something and you have to earn it. Uh, celebrity culture, as we see, they, they, they honor those, those, uh, those celebrities that are generally train wrecks because of the way TV presents them. And it's just fun to watch a train wreck on TV, unfortunately. Social media, which is an altered sense of reality. Um, and then self-esteem movement, we're constantly praising kids for just doing things rather than uh, praising them for working through things. Um, and then that's the whole uh, you know, uh, trophy, uh, trophy culture where kids are, uh, are doing things and earn, earn trophies for just participating. So one of the things that we try to do as much as possible is we embrace adversity with our kids. Um, we, we have them understand that, you know, nothing great was ever accomplished without having to work through things. And then as a team, uh, the way that you respond to adversity um, when it shows up will be collectively how you're uh, remembered. And so I think that it's important for coaches to put your kids through some of those tough situations both mentally and physically throughout the off season and bring it back to them how they've conquered and worked through adversity and you know have have a quick talk after you're done whether you do something in the weight room or you put them in squads and do some things where they have to work through stuff come back to it and have a quick debriefing at the end so that the kids can always bring it home to say hey you know what I actually can work through some of these things so this is you know uh, a quote here that we use is failure is just a temporary place where winners go to learn. And, and, you know, this is a, a picture that I put together of Tom Brady in that Super Bowl uh, just before the half where he was, they had a pick six uh, and uh, just wasn't a good place and time at that moment. But if you look at how the second half went and you see Tom Brady with all the positive self-talk on the sidelines and they ultimately came back and they won the Super Bowl. And this is another one that we, that we use with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And so we show these kids all these different moments in sports history, uh, personal things to coaches, things that happen to, uh, to our leaders where everybody's going to experience some form of adversity and have to work through it. And so one of the things that we do is uh, we put our kids in squads. Uh, all off season, we create squad competitions. And I think for, for our kids, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, to grow our, to grow our, identify, grow our leaders, for them to look, work together in small groups, uh, for us to be able to build some challenges in. And, uh, and I think that for the kids, it's, it's fun. We do that all off season. I've got a way that we keep track of points. We use, we use uh, the Google, uh, Google Docs. So I, I have an Excel form on Google where the kids can take a look at any point in time. They can see how they're doing individually with their points and how their squad points are doing. And we make the whole off season just a big squad competition. And I think that it's great for the kids. Um, and as a coach, you uh, through the points, you can kind of see who your guys are 
uh, and who, who needs a little bit of work. Um, some of the other stuff that we do, we're all about themes. So during the off season, we have, uh, we have weekly themes during the off season. We build a theme for, for the season. So, uh, so our theme for this year was 2020 vision, which, which stands for something. We have uh, weekly themes and daily themes during the year. And I think when you can create stuff like that, you can create a story around it and it creates a picture in their he heads, which makes things easier. And it's a, a little more uh, meaningful to the kids. This is just a picture. Um, when I was at Rancho Verde, I would hang up the theme for the week with just a little a little quote or or something underneath a little uh, a little paragraph of, of of what it meant and this would be uh, put up on their lockers on their Mondays and just kind of that's how we would introduce the theme for the week in the background here uh, you can see there's uh, these sheets that are hung up on the mirror in the weight room and and what we do every Monday morning uh, during the season is they have to come in and they have to set goals for themselves for the week so um, these are these are called commitments. The kids have to commit to three things for the week, and so they could be they could be three skills on the field. It could be an academic goal. It could be a a commitment in the weight room, um, and we have them focus on those things for the week. And what we tell the kids during the season is there's a good possibility if you hit those commitments for the week, we're going to be pretty successful on Friday night. And so we don't talk about winning during the season to our players. I think that you know. I think it's crazy for coaches to assume that your team wants it more than the other team. These are all kids that are what 14 to in some cases, 19 years old. Um, and I think that it's crazy to assume that our team just wanted it, wanted it more. Uh, I think that you can impose your will on people during football games, but I think that we tell our kids, they want it just as bad as you. The thing that's going to be the difference between us and them is we're going to have our goals that we're going to work on hitting uh, during the week uh, and during the game. And that's going to help what uh, gets us through. And we're just going to be totally locked into to what our game plan is. And, and I think that um, when you're the head coach, you, you have to push your kids, but at the same time, you have to know their limits. But it's so important to keep the focus on us and it's got to be all about us. And, you know, I know that it's a little cliche now, but it's really about the process, not the product. The, the end result, winning games happens um, because you're going to be more organized um, or because you're just better than the other team. So we say that it's very important to have a plan um, and that winning is going to be a byproduct of, of all the stuff that we do. As I mentioned, you know, we do our off-season squads. Uh, we teach them how to compete. We identify leaders. Uh, I'll show you a little example here of some of the stuff that we're doing. But um, this is an example of, in our first period, our varsity class, of how I'm keeping track uh, through Google and that at any given point, they can see how they're doing. So here's where players are right now. And we told our players before the whole uh, coronavirus thing happened that you need 250 points to be eligible to continue in the program through spring football. So you can kind of see where, pro, uh, where players are right now and how they're moving and how they're going. And I would be happy if anybody wanted more information on our on our squads and how it works just just hit me up and we'll share the the contact information so that uh, that we can help you out because i think even through this you can get your kids um committed and to keep going and, and work through this we do um we do some different things also uh during the season of uh of rewarding our players as well uh um I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute, but we do in the off season, we do these great physical games that we call combatives. Uh, and if people want to email me, I'd be happy to share them. We make sure we monitor their daily attendance. We grade check our kids. It's so easy to grade check them. I don't even have to give them those, those sheets that we used to give them like five, 10 years ago. And then kids come back and, and, and they've, they've either forged a, a teacher signature or they wrote in what their grade is. We just go online now and I can check their grades because because everybody's doing online grading. Um, we have outreach program where our players, we get them involved in the community. Uh, we're working with elementary and middle schools uh, right now. Uh, we call it the Future Cougars program. When I was at Burroughs High School, we did a great program called Burroughs Buddies. We have a leaders council on our team, position leaders, squad leaders. So there's a lot of different opportunities for kids to be leaders, whether you're a starter or non-starter, offensive player, defensive player, senior or sophomore um, in our program. Uh, and then 
I think also it's very important. Like it's great things happen when you break bread with each other. You can, uh, you can get kids talking. So when I was at some schools, we were able to bring in companies uh, that were foundations that helped feed our kids uh, before they went home from practice. Uh, most schools now have after school meal programs. So our kids get fed before they even come to football practice. Uh, we feed our kids uh, game day. We give our kids snacks at halftime. We give our kids snacks during the week. Every year we have lockdown meetings with our kids. They have to do a, a, a contract, which uh, is a commitment for them. We've done an idea of commitment sticks where uh, they're paint sticks and every kid would would uh, fill out uh, a word or phrase that would describe their commitment to the team for that year. And the sticks were symbolic of each kid. So I would take the stick and break it and say, here's what really each person amounts to. Like on our own, we're, we're, we're weak, we're not very strong. And then we would bind all the sticks together and make it into a brick of, you know, a hundred, a hundred sticks, uh, paint sticks becomes a brick. And we would show our kids that this is just kind of like our team. As individuals, we may be weak, but if we come together as a team, we're indestructible. We do different things where we involve kids in community projects. Uh, we give out weekly awards. So I think there's different ways that you can reward and acknowledge kids when they're putting work in on a daily basis and you can keep it fun because football, such a tough game. It's so humbling. Uh, it's not like a lot of other sports. You only play one game a week uh, during the season. You have a long off season. There's a lot of work that goes into a game, and I think you have to find ways to reward the kids as you're as you're uh, as you're going through the season and and in the off season. So really, it's about you know how do you want the culture of your football program? Um, when you take a look at the top left hand left hand corner, that's uh, showing uh, you know a toxic culture in the form of like a like a gang, um, and then. You don't want your program to be like a country club either. You want your program to be those of elite young men. And the way that you do that is you have to challenge them on a daily basis and not let them coast and not let them feel comfortable. But at the same time, guarding the culture and creating a culture where it's not going to be toxic, where kids get to, to backstab each other um, and, and, and bad mouth coaches. Uh, and I think that takes a lot of work and there's a lot of different things that's involved uh, in that. This is just an example of a declaration of a commitment that, that our players sign uh, at the beginning uh, of every year. And, and it's, uh, it's threefold. It's you know, what we're committing to academics, what we're committing to off the field in the community, and what we're con committing to as a team on the field. So they say that in bad programs, there's no accountability. In good programs, coaches are gonna hold players accountable, but in great programs, the players will hold each other accountable. And I think that's the challenge of coaches is creating a program where the players care enough to hold each other in check and not let kids slide or do things that are going to be detrimental to, to the program. And that's why it's really important to set up your program and define what your vision is um, and what your core values are going to be and what your character quality. So these are just different things where, you know, we, we, we think of football as more than just, you know, stuff that we're doing on the field. Uh, it's, it's a family off the field. Uh, as well. So you can see that that's an example of the paint sticks in the middle. Top left is just having players over to my house every year in small groups. And I think that was our senior class that year came over and had a senior meeting and just getting a chance to, to break bread and talk to the players about what the expectations are of the year. And uh, top right is just after a, a football game where the boosters were tailgating and then they fed the players. Bottom left, uh, that's the El Nasty Award that we give out to an offensive and a defensive uh, lineman. We call it the El Nasty Trench Warrior Award that is sponsored by a, a local restaurant. And that dish that they're having is called the El Nasty. It's a wet burrito that the kids just loved. And it was only open to offensive and defensive players. And then the bottom right is just, you know, using, uh, using our school facilities and after a summer workout, giving our players the opportunity to have some fun uh, in the pool. And I think it's important for coaches to get involved with the players as well. Don't just send them on their own to the local restaurant for the reward. We would have a coach go with them every week. Our coaches got in the pool, whether you had a great body or you had to cover up a bit, we were in there having fun with the players. And then lastly, uh, parents are part of your program. And uh, years ago, uh, I, was, uh, I was at a clinic uh, and I listened to a, a guy who was a very successful athletic director speak. And 
And uh, somebody said, how do, you, how do you involve the parents in the program? And, and his response was, you keep them out. And I left blown away, just wondering, how do you, how do you keep parents out and have success with their kids? Um, they're, they're part of their kids' lives, and they're going to ultimately support their kids so that their kid can be successful. And the only way to do that would be to make them a key ingredient in your program. Have a place for them. Let them know that they're involved for the program, but it's important for, for you as a coach and a program to set the parameters. And I found that, you know, um, I'm not sure how successful I've been with X's and O's and, and what my knowledge is. I, I try to keep it simple, but I feel like I've done a good job uh, along the way of being able to have a role for everybody in our program. Uh, and with the parents is we found a way to connect them. And uh, the way that we've connected them is we've given them, given them a role in the football program. So I think as a coach, you've got to, you've got to keep them informed, give them a way to stay involved, but set the limits and boundaries with them. By the way, uh, I'd be more than happy, Doug, if people want to reach out to me, this, cause we're not, you know, this is, this is kind of a day's worth of stuff here. Um, I'd be more than happy to, to share the, the presentation with them if they want the, the PowerPoint. Um, so some things that we do with the parents is we create a family culture. We, we allow them, we allow them to come and, and talk to the coaches. Um, we create opportunities for them to have a role in the program with our boosters. Uh, we, we give them a calendar of, of events and practices and anytime there's an update, they get it. So it's emailed out multiple times a year. Uh, we use Parent Square so I can connect with all of the parents in our program um, and that they are always informed because communication is the key. And we will, I'm not going to say over communicate, but we're going to use all the different methods of communication so that the parents know what's going on. We have a mandatory parent information night with the, with the PowerPoint. Um, and we let them know, here's what you can expect from the coaches. Here's what we expect from your kids. And here's what we expect from you. We even give them a parent manual. And I found that in our best years, we've done home visits where the coaches have taken the opportunity to go to every, every junior varsity and varsity kids house and meet with the parents for 20 minutes. And that's just really allowed us to stay connected to the parents as well. With, uh, with meetings, we set up the parameters. So we let them know, here's the ways we're going to meet. Um, and this is what we'll meet about, but this is what we're not going to meet about. Because some of, those, some of these things, uh, the things that I would consider inappropriate, are things that I don't feel like we're ever going to come on common ground about. Now, the players can come talk to us about playing time um, and things that are going on. But we would never sit down and talk to our scheme uh, with the parents, other than if we were giving some sort of clinic just to let them see what, what we're doing offensively and defensively. So I think that, you know, just wrapping it up, um, Doug, it's, it, it's really important as a coach to let everybody make your program inclusive. Include people. Don't shut people out. Let people know that this is, this is, all of us working together, all of us are in this together. It's us against the world kind of mentality. Um, make sure that you're constantly rewarding or acknowledging and thanking your staff because uh, those are going to be the guys that do a bulk of the work. Uh, we thank our parents for helping out with things, whether they're on the boosters. Um, we thank the faculty. And I think that simple emails or a phone call really go a long way. It's important to thank the media for what they're doing for our youth. I think they do a lot of great things for promoting high school sports. And I think there's just different ways, you know, gear goes so far when you give somebody an official hat or t-shirt of, of what your kids are wearing. At, at Early in my career, I thought, oh, this is going to be stuff just for the staff and the kids. And I think that, you know, society wants to wear the same gear that the players and the coaches are wearing. We're no different when, you know, we want to wear the same the same stuff that we see the college coaches wearing on the sidelines or the, or the, the professionals uh, uh, wearing. And I think that, you know, the community is the same way. They want to wear the same hat or the same polo shirt uh, that, that you're wearing. They want to have the same t-shirts you're giving your kids. So uh, I think that that's important. Um, and so just wrapping it up, I, I really think that there's never been a time as we have now that uh, our youth need us. 
uh, they, it's up to us to inspire and, and, and lead them and, and help them grow. And, and this is a picture of uh, Tyler Kennedy, a kid that really came a long way in our football program. He went on to play junior college football. Um, and now he's, uh, he's transitioned where he's going to be finishing off his career at an, at an FBS school. And one of those kids that I look back at and, and really kind of hits home when, when I tell people about how, how we need to, uh, to work with our, our uh, young men in this day and age. Hey, great stuff, Coach Steine. I, I, I came up with a couple of questions here as you were, as you were going through. And, there, you know, like you said, there's a lot to digest there. Uh, how, how, are you, how are you hitting a lot of these points home with your team? Is it, a, you know, daily team meetings before practice? Is it, you know, a lot of preseason stuff? Uh, you know, what, what have you found that it's the best way to, to communicate these Well, so, so we communicate on a daily basis. I get to, I'm fortunate. I have all my football players in a football class. So I have a varsity class, a JV class, and a freshman class. So I get to connect with them on a daily basis. During the off season, I have a theme for the week. And so if, uh, if the theme is, let's say, inspire, on Monday, I'm going to kick it off, but I'm going to talk to them about how we would have, how we would have uh, that, that theme built in during the week. So I'll give them a little something on a daily basis. I will even have a breakout or a buzzword. So inspire, inspire I think, was strike a match. Um, and so every time we would break out for that week, we would say strike a match. Uh, I would have the coaches during the season after practice, after I have the quick team meeting, they would go out with their units and the coaches would hit on that theme a little bit as they were wrapping up practice. And then we would point out examples of kids that may be hitting on that theme. I think that as much as possible, um, rather than sitting up and lecturing, when you can create stories or give them a, a clear picture of how something looks, it's so much more, more meaningful to the players. Yeah, I think uh, talking to Randy Jackson last week, who I've gotten pretty close with over the years, he's a you got to find a way to fascinate your kids every day. And a great way to do that is stories, catchphrases like, like you've been able to utilize. Um, so that's, that's great stuff. Now, you know, I, I think something that doesn't really get talked about a whole lot around coaches is, is we talk about core values. But as someone that's been at a couple different schools, how, how do your core values change based on where you're coaching? Or are you keeping those same core values no matter where you are? Yeah, so, so I came up with those core values um, when I was leaving Burroughs. I didn't have them in place. And I was like, okay, what, like, what's important to me? What's been important to me throughout my career? Well, I said, okay, like, I'm just a big relationship guy. So connecting with people, whether they're my kids, whether I'm going to a coach's clinic and talking with other coaches, connecting with their parents, okay, that's very important. So everything's going to be based off relationships. So that's, that's, that's a core value. I always preached the only way you get better is by competing every day at practice and not focusing on your opponent, but you're competing with your teammates, but ultimately you're competing with yourself. You're just trying to do better than you did the day before or the week before. So, okay, competition was big. And, and obviously when you're taking over a, a program, you can believe in competition, but it's going to look very different year one than it's going to look year eight. So when I was at Burroughs High School, like year one competition to compare to year eight competition was totally different, but I was expecting and demanding competition on a daily basis, however it was, but it's all, it's a relative term. Um, and then lastly, just like owning things like taking ownership and being responsible. And that, that, you know, to me, that's no different from just at home with your own kids. So, so I've always embraced those things because I thought that ultimately if you can focus on those three things, those are going to be what, I guess, guide you to be successful wherever you are. Gotcha. Have you, uh, you know, I, I, I had never really considered this seriously, but I heard a coach at a clinic this past year talk about players coming up with the core values. Now, when I talked with Coach Jackson last week, you know, he, he shared his opinion on it. And he, the way he does it is he, he kind of sets things up and steers kids yes. to what really he wants the core values to be. Yes. Um, but, but do you, you, you see value in that and having players come up with it? Yeah. So, so for instance, um, in that, uh, declaration of excellence, um, I will have the players, um, just give me their thoughts on, okay, guys, academics, what are some things that we should, we should be looking at and demand from the team in academics? Give me some points. Um, or when we do goal setting for the year, 
team goals. So we, we actually usually would take the month of March to do it. And we would meet once a week throughout March to come up with both our personal and our team goals for the year. I'm steering them towards what the goal should be, but they may be different in year one than they're going to be at, you know, when you actually get that program going. But I think that when the kids feel like there's ownership, they're more likely to be accountable and responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about your, your squad competition stuff, is that, is that drafted or is that by players or is that put together by coaches? How do you, how do you structure that? I've, I've done it both ways. Um, so we've had a draft um, some years and then some years we just randomly assign kids to different teams. And sometimes I'll purposely put a kid on a team that, um, you know, doesn't know maybe some of the kids or maybe in some cases they haven't got along and now they have to. Um, and I think both ways work. I, I think that once they get going, it's just kind of, it's, it's really cool to see how the leadership takes, uh, takes form and how, the, how those mini squads of whether they're six or eight guys uh, come together. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's lots of opportunities for leadership, it sounds like, in your program with the leadership council and leadership by position. Um, so, so what kind of opportunities do those kids have leadership-wise that, you know, not, not everyone does by being in those positions? So, so if you're a, a position leader, for instance, I will meet with those kids about stuff that I've seen at practice or even things like, okay, hey, like, guys, this is the expectation for, you know, we're going to wear knee pads. We're going to wear knee pads uh, on Tuesdays when we, put our when we put our practice pants on. This is how we're going to wear our practice jersey. Um, these are the colored socks for games. And so it's really easy for me to meet with those kids and then they can go out to their units and make sure that their units are taking care of it. But I'll also at the same time watch to see how they're, how they're communicating with, uh, with their teammates. Because a lot of people think that leading is just making demands on everybody else or giving people ultimatums. And I tell them in a lot of ways is leading, number one, is you setting the example and you being the role model. Um, so, so when you have your position leaders and your squad leaders and your leadership council leaders. You have a lot of different leaders in the program and everybody feels like they're a leader or not everybody, but a good group of kids mm -hmm. feel like they're leaders in some way. It really makes it easier to get them to do the things that need to be done. The small things. That's awesome. Thank, thanks a lot for hopping on with coach. Tiny. Uh, appreciate your time, man. Appreciate you guys. Thanks a lot. And, and uh, uh, stay safe and be healthy.